That's a great question. You know, and you, you're putting the crucial questions that are there right at the beginning of this incredible moment. Because remember, in that Acts passage, they are hearing this in their own language coming from someone who sh under no circumstances should know their language. And so what is astounding in that is that they're, that the spirit is creating a reality of belonging that they don't imagine even should be there. But my former colleague who's now a blessed memory, Lyman Sani, he would always um, translate that moment when they say, we, we hear them speaking in, other, in our languages, he would always say that he, they heard them speaking in our mother tongue, which is to say, they heard them speaking in the language that mama says in the safe, intimate spaces of our home. It's not just that they knew the language formally, but the way mama talks to me, that's what I heard coming out of them. And so the question, how, how is it that they got that deep inside my reality to be able to speak to me in ways beyond just kind of the formal language? I'm like, you, you know my mama now, you know my mama. And that, to me, is the place where we want to put those crucial questions you just named. What does it mean that there are those who are outside of my world captured inside border and boundary, but now through the spirit, not only have they come through, transgressed that border and boundary, but they have entered the intimate space of intelligibility for me. And this, I take it, is precisely what the spirit is aiming us toward. Aiming us toward a level of intimacy together where the secrets of our family are now shared and we are inside the shared desires and hopes and aspirations there in that space in ways that now define who we will be in this world. This is why when I did my company with Acts, I, used to get, I got so irritated with the, with the New Testament scholars because they all kept saying that this is a miracle of hearing. I said, yeah, okay, it's a miracle of hearing, but it's also a miracle of speaking. Why? Because if you remember, the difference between Acts 1 and 2 is the whole deal, right? Acts 1, the disciples are looking at a resurrected Jesus and they want weapons. They say, you're so glad you were risen from the dead. Now we're going to take over, baby. We're going to take over now. Because you got all the power. Come on, Lord. We're ready to go. We're ready to go. Let's drop this thing. And the Lord said, I'm going to give you power. And then Acts 2. Acts 2 is the direct response to the nationalist desire of Acts 1. Acts 2, right? They get power, but it's not power over people. It's power for people. So remember in Acts 2, this is, what, this is what all the commentators say but don't say. Nobody in Acts 2 asked for what happened in Acts 2. There's no prayer that I will be speaking in the mother tongue of these people. Ain't nobody looking for that. <laughs> That's not what Acts 2 was hoping for. But this is precisely what is at stake, right? And so it is that, that miracle of not just hearing, that miracle of language that clearly aims toward intimacy is what is in Acts 2. And now, of course, we know that the way national existence is configured and the way educational existence is configured inside of that pushes precisely against that. But now, what would it mean to imagine an educational process that, as I said, pushes toward that deep level of belonging? So that when I am finished with my education, I, I am embodying the logic of Acts 2. So again, I'm repeating myself. So that people hear me as someone who's been trained to be a pastor. People hear me as someone who's trained to be a professor, a lawyer, a doctor, and they say, I hear my mom and them coming out of him or her or them. I hear 
a connection that I never would have imagined I hear coming out of this person. Which suggests love. 